Hey, what's up developers? In this video, you are going to meet Curtis. Curtis has been in the software industry for over 25 years, quarter of a century. He's done interviewing, he's done hiring, he's worked on different teams, and currently he is the vice president of academics over at App Academy. In today's video, I'm talking to him about some portfolio and interview tips to help junior developers. Also be sure to stay tuned because at the end of this video, I'm gonna be sharing with you how you can win a three month mentorship plan. App Academy is hooking you guys up. App Academy also sponsored this video, so shout out to them for making this all possible. How important is a portfolio for your typical software student? So when I look at a resume, or I look when personally as a, as a hiring manager, um, when I look at a resume, I will see a person's own descriptions of what it is they've done, you know, what languages they know. But if there's a GitHub link on there or a GitLab link or a, a Bitbucket link, I will immediately go there and start looking at their code because that, that to me is more of a testament as a software developer, as, as one of their peers, to be able to, to, to see what it is that they can create. In my opinion, resumes um, are an outmoded way to be able to advertise your skill uh, because hiring itself is still this weird dated industry where you, know, you have recruiters and you know they have to like put things into their own database and it's all keyword searches. That's whatever. If you have a portfolio and you can show, it's just like an artist. If, if you can pull out your portfolio and show them the masterpieces that you've created, oh. How compelling is that? Right, right. And so you're looking at the actual code too. You're not just testing out the demo, but you're looking at the code. So what are you looking for when you when you go through it? Um, uh, that's a really good question. And um, here's the thing. So I am looking uh, again. I'm looking for um, I'm looking for aspects that make me think that this software developer knows that they're writing code not for themselves. Again, right, it's, I'm looking for maintainability. And so oddly enough, one of the first things I look at in terms of their source code files is the formatting that they use. Mm. Uh, are the, is the indentation all weird and off? Do they have like strange like curly braces all over the place or things don't line up? In my opinion, that is a sign of somebody who is not interested in refining their craft and sharing it with others. Or maybe they just never had the opportunity to know that that the code that they're writing, like you said, you write it once, but it's seen a hundred times. I, I don't want people to see like my my scrawls. I want them, you know, give somebody something that that I know that they can understand. When does the light bulb go off to make you say, you know what, this person deserves a callback, and I want to interview them? It's anything non-trivial, and um, I read it and. So, uh, because I have experience, and I think that most hiring managers um, will kind of have you know three or more years of experience, and in the code, in the language that they're interested in, you can like scan code pretty quickly to figure out how things are laid out. And so, in a, for example, the the programmer hasn't done something which is obviously inefficient, unless they actually call it out. Like this is an academic exercise that I just want to show is obviously inefficient. You know. If nothing's obviously inefficient, if they're using their frameworks correctly, um, these are the things that tell me this person is interested in creating features. And that's what I would like is somebody who can come on my team and help my team implement features. Um, so it, it doesn't have to be, it, I'm not looking for amazing and I'm not looking for um, inspired. I'm looking for, I'm looking for somebody who actually cares about the code. Um, and, and, and the way that they're talking to me, because when I'm reading that, I'm reading a story. Programming interviews and dev interviews, they kind of sometimes, not always, um, but they sometimes ask questions that are, I don't want to say archaic, but they seem, they kind of are, and they're just impractical. I mean, uh, deserializing a binary tree or whatever, I mean, it's interesting, but I mean, it's just something that most people don't do at, as a junior in their everyday job duties. Um, so that has been said that, it's been said that interviewing is its own skill. So from that perspective, what advice can you give to people preparing for their first role? If you're gonna end up going to a company that has that kind of interview, and, and you can find those types of resources online to see 
what type of questions companies ask, whether or not it's very computer science-y as opposed to something else. Google, um, Google, you know, they do computer science-y questions like what if I have enormously huge arrays and I want to be able to merge them in Python? What are the best ways to do that given certain conditions? So knowing how memory is, you know, used, uh, especially in distributed systems. That would be something you'd want to know if you're going for a job like that at Google. But in my in my opinion, you will see that a lot of companies have changed their interviewing practices from, like you said, this more arcane, archaic, you know, secret information that only the computer science majors had to um, more practical things. So, for example, um, so for example, we just interviewed somebody today, okay. um, and we were talking about merge sorts. But we didn't say, how do you do merge sort? Because when we asked them, hey, do you remember how to do merge sort? They said, not really. We said, great, hold on. So we drew how to do a merge sort conceptually, and then we pair programmed on how to actually implement that in Ruby. So, so I, this, this sort of collaborative um, interviewing process is something that I have seen um, a lot more in the last 10 years um, and have been a proponent of um, ever since I started becoming an active software. To study up on, this, on your computer science if you can, but there, there are plenty of resources out there and, and really great online resources, videos to be able to watch to, to know these things. But um, in my opinion, in my opinion, an interview process will tell you as much about the company as it does about you. And so if, if that's what they value, but they don't. But they don't want you to actually write how to serialize a binary tree. Why are they asking the question? That's a good point too. I just got a comment today from someone who said they had graduated a boot camp and they had been going to some interviews that just kind of got them feeling dejected because the, some of the questions you just never. They just seem so trivial at times because they don't apply to the job, and so. I'm glad you mentioned and talk about this a little because I know that is a pain point for so many people, um, boot camp graduate or otherwise, um, you know, studying up for these um, types of questions and really, like you mentioned, focusing or investigating that employer. You know, is that the type of employer you'd want to work for? And if yes, you know, study up. But if not, there are many other employers out there who do, you know, take home coding tests or just have a traditional interview where they ask you about your projects or experience and stuff. So there's more than one employer out there. And I think that can um, sometimes uh, not be evident to people because we hear about Google, we hear about Facebook, but I mean, there's just, there's hundreds of thousands of people out there who could employ a developer anytime. You know, you hear about those companies, but you also hear about companies like United Airlines and hear about companies like Bank of America. And you hear about companies, you know, all of these Fortune 100 companies, they all have huge active software development organizations within their company. It's just their primary focus is in software. Um, so when, when we talk about like enterprise software, that's what we were talking about. And there are so many of those jobs out there. And um, it may not be as cool to work for Capital One, for example, because, oh, my friends work at, you know, insert tech company here, and I work at Capital One, but Capital One is one of the most forward-facing um, or, or forward-moving tech companies in the U.S. today. Um, their, CF, or their CEO five years ago said, we're not going to be a credit card company anymore. We're going to be a software company that provides credit to people, and it changed the entire way they do business. So really look at the companies that, that you're investigating and the options that you have available. Because you may be surprised, some of those companies are on the cutting edge. Okay. What are some just tips or tricks you have for people who are not very good at interviewing? Because it is a skill and some people just, it's just not their strong spot. How, what tips can you give for them? So one of the reasons that coding boot camps in most places are, are also an interesting and good investment is because we help you learn how to interview which is something that you wouldn't necessarily get if you were just doing the free version. So I just wanted to like, tie that back into a question that you asked earlier. Why would you pay for a coding bootcamp? Uh, because a lot of them, including App Academy, provide you with skills and help you build your portfolio and resume and all that other stuff so that you can actually become a very viable and visible candidate. For people who have a hard time interviewing, 
this is, it's such a hard thing to overcome. And I feel so for, um, for, for folks who end up like, I used to be this way myself. I would show up and I would be so nervous, right? It would just, it would just, it would almost paralyze me. Um, so uh, here's one of the things that I think is interesting is actually talking. It, it turns out when you sit down and you internalize things in, in your brain and you think about things, you use one part of your brain and it's a good part of your brain. But this part here where you and I are talking together and in an interview when I'm under pressure, because technically I'm in an interview here, I am under a little bit of pressure. I mean, I don't want to mess up. This is going to be on your YouTube channel. <laughs> right. Right. So I, I at least some thousands of people are going to see my face. So I need to be able to feel comfortable enough. And one of those things that, that really drives comfort is the ability just to be able to speak. We don't talk to ourselves. And so being able to it's it's an old ad, stand in front of a mirror and talk to yourself. That's really a big thing. If you have the opportunity, join a, a club like Toastmasters, where you are asked to present speeches. Um, because this this public speaking of just between you and somebody else, that's that's often one of the biggest things that's hard to overcome is the ability to be able to craft sentences in your mind on the fly. So if you can do that, then the real hard part is being able to figure out the problem. And then for that, you just need to be able to prepare yourself in the same way that you would prepare yourself for a test. So you want to study, but you want to study intelligently. Don't cram. Cramming is bad. You want to be able to, like, um, for whatever reason, like you said, they, they ask arcane questions. So brush up on your data structures a, a little bit if you can and your, your algorithms if you can. Um, and then uh, read, the art, read the job description that you're applying for. So if it says things like unit testing in there and you've never written a unit test, make sure you at least understand what it means to unit test and then be honest about it. Say, um, you know, say I've only ever read unit tests. I've only ever made them pass. I'm, I'm not great at creating new unit tests right now, but I would love to be able to learn from your team on how you do it for your practice. Good, good advice. And on the topic of uh, junior developers and getting their first job, what yeah. are some things they should be doing to keep their job? Not just that, but to indicate to their employer that they're a quality hire, that they should, you know, this, this person was worth the investment. I would, like to, I would like to hedge this answer by giving a couple of scenarios, if that's okay. Sure. So, um, so there are companies where you will get hired into, and um, there are safe place. Uh, there, there are lots of companies like this that, that I have seen. And when I say a safe place, I mean, it's okay for you to say, I don't know, and I need help. Um, in those companies, uh, if, if, you, if you get into a team that's like that, try to work through your problem, right? Try to make sure that you, you're doing what you can. But if you can't solve that problem, ask somebody for a help. Because being able to say, I don't know, um, will reduce the amount of overall time it takes you to implement a feature uh, because you can actually get help and they can point you to documentation or point you to example code that's already in the code base for you to be able to model your code on. So that's really important. Um, in the other hand, let's say you get into uh, a team that is more off-standish. Um, I would recommend in that case, continuing to struggle, but really focus on learning the business and what it is that the business, the business value that you're adding. That doesn't hurt in the other case as well. Um, but it turns out in, in a lot of companies, the software developers actually understand the business of the company better than the business people because they're the ones who listen to the requirements of the things that are happening in the company and then turn that into active software. And by turning that into active software, they become so familiar with the intimate details of every moving piece of the company that they become experts in that company. And CEOs may come and go, managers may disappear and move to Bermuda or whatever it is they do, but you'll find software developers that have been there for five years and, and know everybody and understand everything. Yeah. And they become focal points. So if, to show that you are a good hire, um, I don't want to say make yourself indispensable because that's not the right goal. What it is, though, is show your value by being 
by being valuable to the business. Do you think a person who's only in it for the money can have a long-term career, career in software? I think the answer is yes. Why? Um, okay, so the reason that people normally are in it for the money is so that they can use that money to do something that they really enjoy. I have another friend. Um, I'm not going to use his name, but I have another friend. His dad sold Snap-on tools, and he grew up in his dad's garage. And the only thing that he really loves is cars. That's that's. It, it is such a stereotype that I just you know when I first met him, I thought you are a stereotype. You're you're a dude who loves cars, but he's also smart, and he's like, how am I going to be able to fund? this thing that I've got. So he's software programs. It's, he does not love programming. He's not passionate about becoming an architect, but he is a good solid developer who's able to create maintainable code that other developers can maintain. And that in my opinion is the hallmark of a really great developer is we don't write code for ourselves. We write code for other people to see. All right, developers, here's what's up. If you want to win a three-month mentorship plan to App Academy Open, here's what you have to do. Number one, be subscribed to this channel. Number two, leave a comment telling me that you're interested in this mentorship plan. And what this does is that it gives you daily access to the App Academy instructors through a Slack channel. They're going to be helping you out to answer technical questions, provide guidance as you go through App Academy Open. I will be randomly selecting a winner, so if you get a YouTube notification, be sure to read it because you may have just won the prize.